Hello, hello everyone. Good morning. We are broadcasting live from a very brisk and chilly Vancouver morning here in Canada. Uh, welcome to our uh, Ask Me Anything webinar session on spatial ETL and GIS data transformations. Uh, before we get started, I would like to um, share on how you can um, ask questions and come on air to ask whatever questions you might have for today's session. If you uh, want to ask questions, uh, if you go to your left side of your panel screen for this session, you will see that there is a uh, click hand, raise hand button on the GoToWebinar control panel. Click that and I will promote you into a panelist. Once you're a, a panelist, have your mic and video camera ready as I will be putting you live and you can ask your question there. If you don't want to show your face or if you don't want to be on air live, you can always type your question through the chat option that we have over here. Type in your question there, hit send, and we will try our best to get to it. Now, uh, before as we get started with the session, uh, guys, do you want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, that sounds good. Mark, do you want to lead us off? Sure. So I'm Mark Stokes. I'm with the FME Application Experts here, focusing on GIS, a lot of utility work recently. Next up. I'm Dan Heisminger. I'm working on the desktop team with support, trying to answer questions like these. Awesome. And I'm Chris, also on the desktop support side. So I've um, been helping out a lot in the community on different webinars, and you might have seen um, all three of us in the world, world tour and world fairs before too. So happy to help and looking forward to all the questions you guys have for us. All right, we have our experts ready and we are waiting for questions before when we before we get started on the live questions that we have, we have a bunch of questions that were asked from our previous sessions. So let's get to them. Um, the first question that came up is I hear terms like ETL and ELT, ETLT and reverse ETL. Does FME do them all? What do you think, guys? Yeah, I think this one's a, a good discussion one. Um, FME can can really handle all of those. The order, uh, ETL, ELT, ETLT, and so on and so forth, that doesn't really matter because um, everything that you can do with FME is built into a workflow. So uh, you can obviously start off translation with reading in the data from a reader. Um, if you need to do an SQL query on your database, uh, you can do that as well. Um, the order isn't really important because we do have readers, writers, and transformers that can also allow you to read and write data mid-translation. Uh, mid so uh, FME, yes, can do all of those. Um, Marker, Dan, any, any additional points there? Yeah, the, I, I think the reverse ETL one is kind of amusing. That's um, a term that seems to be popping up more frequently now. So people think of ETL as taking data and loading it into some sort of a master warehouse. Um, but then you might want to get it back out again to use it. And that's what some people are now calling reverse ETL, where you're taking the data from your warehouse and putting it into places where you can really use it. And of course, that's a really strong use for FME as well. So I would say, the overall answer is a strong yes to, to that question. But one of the other things to remember, of course, is that um, forward backward translations are not always, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not truly reversible in some cases. So you might uh, go in one direction and you might lose some information going into a warehouse. So to recover that back, uh, that might be difficult. Um, I would say symbology is a classic case of that. So if you load data in from AutoCAD, there's a lot of into say Oracle or SQL Server. There's a lot of symbology in those AutoCAD files that when you try and get back out to an AutoCAD file, you might have lost that symbology. All right. We just have a one question that came up live in our session. Uh, and it is, I like to know how to merge touching polygons onto a single polygon. Christian, you want to yeah, take for sure. Yeah. Uh, so with that one, yeah, uh, I, I sent out in the chat that we we're going to answer this one live as well. Uh, the answer for that one is to use the dissolver transformer. Um, this is a very common GIS operation as we do have the tools for this in FME Workbench. So this would be a, a dissolve. So wherever the polygons are touching, dissolve that common boundary and essentially merge them into one single polygon. So we do have an accompany, accompanying um, article. If anyone does need that, just send us a quick chat in and we will send you that link. Um, but otherwise, you can find it just by searching um, on the FME community. 
just for merging polygons or it's simply just pipe typing in dissolver and it should pop up. All right. Uh, we have uh, one more question that was asked in our previous webinar session. And the question was, how can I best leverage spatial data? That's, uh, that's a pretty broad brush uh, question. Uh, how can I best leverage spatial data? Well, it depends what you want to do with it, you know, it's, um, and depends where it is. So I don't even know whether I, where I can start on, on, on that one. <laughs> um, but I would say using FME, maybe that's the answer that uh, <laughs> you can give. Just in general, FME taking care of all uh, data related issues, yeah? Yeah, outside of actually making a really nice mapping environment, which is, you know, we're not a mapping tool per se in FME. Yeah. So I would, if you want to leverage your spatial data and show it as a map, then you probably want to use FME to get it into a, a platform where the mapping tools are really strong. Um, but if you want to just manipulate your data, you can start with FME, let's say. All right. Okay. So we, another live question just popped in. It asks, does FME 2020.2 support uh, MRSID generation for reading or just generation three? Daniel, you want to handle that? Um, I would if I knew the answer, but I don't. Um, yeah, I was trying to find the answer to that and I, I couldn't find it just yet. So I think we're going to have to get back to that. Um, person that uh, asked that question yes, later on sure. with the research. So that's Mr. Sid from Lizard Tech. It's a licensed um, format and we do support it, but I don't know what version we're supporting. So I'm assuming that person knows that we're supporting version three or gen three, it looks like they call it. So we'll, we'll try and get back to you on that one. All right, okay. Another question that was uh, well asked was, what are some of the best practices for dealing with challenges like transforming data into open standards? We should have Dean Hintz here. He's our yeah. open standards uh, guy. Um, open standards vary, but mostly around uh, XML, I would guess, or GML. Um, lots of uh, different standards for moving data around. Best practices for that? Um, under, I guess the best practice is understanding that standard because some of them are extremely complex. A couple of us at SAFE right now are working on a standard called SIMXML, which is the common information model which is used by utilities for, or it's starting to be used by utilities to move data backwards and forwards, and that is a really complex data model for just moving data from one platform to another, mostly from GIS into ADMS systems. Um, Inspire is an open standard used a lot in Europe, and then there's loads of XML standards, City GML, and so on for moving other types of data, City GML being 3D data. So really, I would say the practice is to really understand that standard and then know your source data. And the other thing about moving data into standards is uh, we all think our GIS data is nice and clean and perfect, but it's actually usually not. So when you start a migration of that type, you usually find out that there are holes in your data that need patching before you can actually get where you want to go. All right. We just had a bunch of live questions just come in. I'll just prop them on over here. Uh, is there a way to remove all palettes except one? Some, but not all of my data has a normal palette and a string palette, but FME barfs up on a string of palettes, so I need to get rid of it. If I can select a band of palette and remove the rest, would that be good? The reverse of raster banner keeper and for palettes. That's a good question. Yeah, and we don't really have a, I think between the three of us probably, uh, LIDAR and raster is, is our weakest point here. But I would guess that there is. Like there are lots of tools in FME for manipulating um, raster data. I don't know whether we've, what our um, articles on um, the community look like in terms of um, handling raster data, but um, 
yeah, we don't. I don't. I think you're right. We probably don't support a string palette right now. Um, but uh, I think that's probably justified opening a case with us, or actually popping that onto the. Better still, popping that onto the community as a question. If you got a sample of the raster, I think somebody would help you there. All right. Or, or the, post that on the ideas page. Yeah. Well, if it's if it's not doing what we want, that definitely comes yeah. on the ideas page there. <clears throat> Yeah, we do have one article. Um, I'm just kind of flipping through it to see if it might cover this, like at all. Um, I can send this out in the in the chat. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a very good question. All right. So another live no chat. Another live question which came up is: What's the best way to send an email alert summarizing if so, so uh, for submitting to portal was successful or not, but without server? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways you could handle that um, in desktop. I think probably the easiest way would be using a feature writer. Um, when you use a feature writer instead of just a traditional writer, you do have, uh, there's that, let me pull it up just so I can see exactly what it's called. You have a success uh, or you have a summary port. So the summary port's gonna output one feature for every successful um, write, in this case, if it's going up to portal. So that way you'll know the data was successfully pushed up there. From there, you can connect an email or transformer and that would notify you. Uh, so it'd be sort of a similar operation to doing it on server. Um, obviously, you don't have all the benefits of automation or anything like that, but that would be one way of handling it in, in Workbench. Okay. But those, just to add to that, I, those tools are a lot easier in FME server nowadays. So if you can get that job onto FME server, that's the direction I would go. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because even with the uh, with FME server, if something fails, you can have it retry again. So with desktop, you'd have to wait for that. Say it happens overnight, uh, two in the morning. Um, you're not going to want to check your email at two a.m. You're probably going to want to be sleeping, and you would have to wait to get back into the office to run it again. Whereas with FME server, you can just try again three, four times, uh, set whatever uh, iteration you want, and then it can retry. Okay. Our other question which had popped up is, is there a best practice repeated uh, for, for repeated scheduled ETL operations? For instance, if I perform the same ETL every, every night, what is the best scheduling method and practice? How about logging and error failure handling? Well, we were just touching on that really. I mean, I think uh, FME server is your answer there. If you can get it into your organization, there's a lot of very good licensing, uh, alternative ways of licensing FME. And if you can get it up into the cloud, there's FME Cloud as well, which is FME Server running in a cloud, which is a very cost-effective way of getting your hands on FME Server. So definitely, uh, we would recommend FME Server build your workflow on the FME desktop environment, publish that workflow to FME Server, and then there's tons of tools within the automations for scheduling or getting jobs running from different ways from triggers and all sorts of things um, if you can't get your hands on FME server then there are little tools out there for scheduling jobs I mean there's Windows scheduler but it always we we get quite a lot of support calls around using Windows scheduler because of, it's just an awkward thing to use it seems um, but so uh, there are third-party apps as well so you could try that but FME Workbench and FME Server are designed to work together. So that would be our recommendation for sure. <clears throat> All right. Uh, our uh, other question was, any secrets to effectively using webhooks in FME, desktop and server? Yeah, for the webhook side of things, that would be more on the server side. Um, with those automations that Mark was just mentioning, one of the triggers that we have sort of kick off one of those automations is a webhook being received. So we do have an example of this with a survey one, two, three um, survey being submitted. Essentially that sends a webhook to FME server and that kicks off a series of workspaces. So the way it all kind of ties together, and we'll, maybe we'll it'll start off with a bit of a general overview. FME desktop is intended to be that authoring piece where you build your workflows. You can obviously build the workflows on your desktop machine and run them individually. But the intention here is with FME server, you can publish the workspaces and have them running um, in, in something like an automation or a schedule or as a workspace app. So if you want to have the full thing 
automated and really hands off, that's where FME Server comes in. You publish your workspace to there and you can create it, uh, create an automation and include the workspace in there, which could be triggered from either, yeah, that schedule or a webhook coming, coming in and kicking off that workspace. So that's kind of how the, the two tie together there. So we can send out that article for uh, the survey one, two, three uh, example for webhooks, because that should cover kind of all the, all the secrets and everything you should need to know for webhooks. It should be relatively straightforward. I just need to get that pay, payload URL um, copied and pasted in. All right, uh, guys, if you're joining right now, just so you know, if you wanna ask a question, uh, if you wanna come live on air, uh, make sure you press the raise hand option and I will be getting you to you shortly and putting you as a presenter so you can uh, ask your question live. Make sure you have your mic and video camera on. And if you don't wanna come on air live, you can always put your questions to our chat and we will get to it in the session. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for, for sending in all your questions so far. There's a lot of great, a lot of great questions that have come in. So we'll, we will do our very best to get to all of those and keep them coming. We look distracted. It's because we're trying to research on our second screen here uh, some of the questions and bring up articles or so on for reference. Yeah, that's why you see us doing this all day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're really, they're really good questions. So. We have one question, which is, is it possible to use FME to compare values in cells of two different spreadsheets and find changes in values between the cells? I am being asked to find changes I to identically formatted spreadsheets and find changes that may have been made by others. Okay. That's a good one. Yes. Um, who wants to cover change detection? I can find the article uh, while someone talks okay. about it. I'll let, I'll let you look for that. Yeah, they just use a change detector, and with FME you can read the uh, the cell identified by the by the column and the row. Um, is there anything else unique to the cell? Um, but once you know that, you could just say, you know, is it from a different source, and or we have the input and output, I guess, different um, source and possibly changed input. Yeah, so it's a very easy thing to do. It's um, find those changes. Uh, there's a webinar on that as well, actually. We did a great webinar, or, or I think even a couple of webinars on that. So we'll try and dig those up. Yeah, change detection is, uh, is a very, very common operation. So that's a, a very, very popular transformer, and we have a lot of different resources for that. So um, if you're stuck with that at all, okay, yeah, please feel free to reach out either on the forums um, or anywhere else, and we're, we're happy to help answer any questions you have there, but hopefully we have that answered in either of those articles or the webinars. And just wanted to mention as well, with, with all the community links that we'll be sending out, um, all of those typically have a workspace attached with it and sample data. So you can kind of see exactly what's happening in the workspace. So we're not gonna send you off with just, a, just an article saying, hey, go read this. You'll have an example to look at too. Um, and in some cases, you'll also have a, a video to kind of explain and walk you through it as well. So. Lots of different learning resources that'll help you on your FME journey. FME journey. Yeah, the webinars are a great resource and we often forget about those. So I've just put into the chat there how you can find them and then the search in there is uh, pretty straightforward. So it's a good way to find um, sort of more comprehensive overviews of some of the topics you might be interested in. All right. Um, another question we had is, is there a good guide or resource for writing appending to uh, relationship classes or related tables? Mm, thanks, Brittany. I've uh, replied to her. There's an article on that on the uh, community. Should sort of be a tutorial that leads you through that. Uh, relationship classes in GIS are tricky because after me itself cannot create those relationship classes. But uh, if you create the relationship class of the style that you want within ArcGIS or Arc Pro, then um, FME should be able to write to them and make all the joins for you. All right. Um, one more question that came up is, what transformers would uh, I use to extract coordinates, reproject, and write to columns in attribute tables? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different uh, coordinates uh, transformers. Um, 
Honestly, there's a lot of different operations that you have in that question. So for extracting, we would have something like the coordinate extractor. Uh, that would be if you want the individual points. If you want the coordinate system name in an attribute, that would be from the coordinate system extractor. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of different ways you can do that depending on if you want the individual coordinates or if you want the coordinate system. Um, with coordinates, if you're working with points, obviously that'll come through as just an X, Y point. Um, if you have a polygon or a line, it'll, you'll end up getting a list of all the vertices. So you can kind of have these formatted slightly differently depending on how you need them. With the coordinate extractor, uh, it'll by default come through as a list attribute. So it's just a different way of handling attributes in FME. Um, but I can send a coordinate system uh, article in the chat uh, because we have a lot of different resources for this again, which talk to um, all the different coordinate specific transformers. There's also all the reprojecting transformers, um, also the geometry extractor. Um, there's also an attribute reprojector. I don't, don't think it gets used too much. If you wanted to um, extract some coordinates and then to an attribute and then reproject them. Yeah, that attribute uh, reprojector is actually really handy. I've had to use that quite a few times. Okay, another question we had was, can I have FME, FME workspace to create shapefile when the shapefile is 100% done and start creating a Google file with fan out option uh, on by a polygon name? I'm not quite sure what the questioner means about the Google file, but uh, Chris already alluded to this. If you want a two-step process, um, you can use the feature writer. So we've got two ways of writing out data in FME largely. One is using the traditional writers where you see the feature types as brown objects stuck on your canvas. And then the other way is to use a transformer called the feature writer. It's got a cousin called the feature reader, which works in the same way. And that's the writer all wrap, writers all wrapped up in a single transformer. And then once the writing has finished, you can trigger other tasks in the workflow. And so that might be what you're looking for there. Um, so using the feature writer, once you've written out uh, to your shapefile, then you can trigger the next part of your workflow, which will be to do whatever you want to do with your Google files. And just adding on to that too, uh, for the Google, file part. Um, if you're doing this on FME desktop and you have Google Drive uh, mounted to your machine, you can just uh, put your files in uh, in a writer or feature writer just as if you're writing to any other local local drive. Otherwise, we also have the Google Drive connector. So you can write the file to your local machine and then upload it to Google Drive. Um, but again, yeah, it kind of depends on what, uh, what you're meaning there with Google file, um, because there's a lot of different options that you have there with that. All right. Another question that came up was when you are updating an existing feature service in ArcGIS online from a CSV, how do you add an object ID for the new records? Um, it should be, that should be uh, ArcGIS online generated, is it not, Mark? Yeah, yeah, it should be. Yeah, ArcGIS should handle that for you. We can't write the object ID in ArcGIS for query. Okay, um, another question was, what is the best way to capture features written summary to then send in an email or some other notification on server or workbench? Back to our old our feature writer again. Um, there's an output port on the feature writer, that's the summary. And so once you've uh, written everything out, um, you'll get a summary which tells you what you wrote um, and you can restructure that. I think it comes out in some sort of list format if I remember correctly. And then you can either trigger an email from your FME server, which I think would be the better way to do it, or you could use the email within Workbench. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, otherwise, you're stuck with digging out of the FME log and that's a bit harder to do. Yeah. Yeah, with that feature writer summary uh, attribute, as Mark mentioned, they do come through as lists. Uh, that's just because if you're running something like a fan out, 
you're gonna have multiple summary features because it should be one for each file that is written. Uh, you end up getting the, the name of the file that was written as well as the number of features that were written to. So you get the, the it's called the data set parameter, uh, you get the feature type name as well as the uh, total features written and the count of how many files were written as well. Four tables if that was a database. Yeah. All right. Um, so another question is, what is the difference between add point and replace with point or on vertex creator transformer? That one's a really good question and it, uh, it can make a couple people stumble. Um, so add point would be adding a vertex. Uh, replace with point would be replacing the whole geometry if you're sending in something with geometry with a single point. Uh, so say you're reading in a CSV file and they have X, Y coordinates. By default, uh, depending on those, those attribute names, we can automatically create the geometry for you. So essentially the vertex creator uh, is redundant in this case. So if you had add a point, it would essentially put a point right on top of the existing point. If you did replace with point, it would just add, uh, or it would replace the entire geometry with that single point. So you can think of the add point as it's adding a vertex versus replace with point is replacing the entire thing with just a single geometry. It looks like we have another question here. Once you read the Excel file, how do you update it in the sheet without reading it again? Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have done that before. I think this has uh, also been asked on the community a little while ago, so we're trying to mull that one over. So the, I think the question is, is sometimes when you do operations in Excel, those operations don't update immediately and they update when you open the Excel file. And the problem is that FME um, doesn't use the Excel um, ADO or COM API. We use a third party API. And the reason we do that is because then FME is totally independent of Excel. But then when we open the file, we don't trigger those behaviors. So those behaviors are often when you've got a macro in the file or certain calculations in the file, somebody does an update to that file and those actions don't get triggered until the next person opens the file. And so sometimes you'll get an Excel file and you'll try and read some data from it that you're expecting there and it's not there because the structure of that data is triggered by opening the actual the file itself. So I think that's something we're trying to figure out, uh, I'm pretty sure we have done it before, but I just couldn't uh, find it in the short term. So we're, we're looking into that. All right. Okay, another question that came up was, do you have any data sets or samples related to converting IFC or CTGML? I can take a look on the community. I think one comes to mind for IFC, but I'm not sure if it goes to, to G, uh, city GML. I can double check, and if it does, I will send that link in the uh, in the chat to you. Yeah, we definitely have articles about working with IFC. Um, I think some of those might be related to indoor mapping work that we've been doing as well. So sometimes our articles don't specifically go from the your source format to the target format you want. So you might have to kind of read up in a couple of art articles to understand the source data structures and the target data structures, but definitely FME supports both of, both of those. Mm. Yeah, and I just found that article and, and I sent the link in the chat. Uh, so we actually do have a specific article for BIM to GIS. In this case, we are working with IFC to City GML. Um, we have them for a couple of different levels of detail. So I think this one that I sent goes from level of detail 300 in IFC to level of detail four uh, for CDGML. There should be a few different options um, and linked tutorials throughout that page too. So that should answer some questions for you. And there's also kind of more accompanying ones for if you need to create textured CDGML models as well and other BIM, BIM specific articles. Okay. So Brian asks, I'm looking to sync our SD database from PostGIS. So I want to populate the whole database and then sync the two on regular basis. One issue I have is I found uh, around the table qualifiers schema name, as this would go into a feature data set with the same name. 
So is it possible to stop uh, to drop the schema name? Uh, otherwise, when they come through, it changes the file name. Okay, I, I can go for that one. Yeah, I mean, basically the question is around how FME handles um, a table qualifiers. So these are kind of odd things. Um, usually the username or um, something is prefixed onto the table name. And depending on how you read the data, your FME feature type will come across with that table name. So there's a um, a hidden prime, a hidden attribute, the format attribute we call it, which is called FME feature type, and that usually dictates what the source table name is and where you want the target table name to go. And so you can manipulate that just like you can any other attribute. And so if you have a table that's being read with the qualifier, you'll get the qualifier dot table name, and then you could use something like um, string replacer or whatever to do a bit of regular expressions to split that into two parts and then um, on the SDE side that I think the questioner is asking whether we can make that the feature data set and uh, yes we can. But um, one thing to remember when you're writing to, to your database is the feature data set is used when your um, you configure and you set up your data, but you that table name is or the feature class name is still unique. So actually, you don't really need the feature data set when you're writing because it will always SDE will always find it because it, it, so the feature class name is unique even though it's wrapped up in a feature data set. But you would be able to set the feature data set as well. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for uh, answering this. Brian, I hope that answers the question. I think for that second part, it was just asking, uh, we are working on setting up a portal and have a lot of services that go up and down and are changing. This means the rest endpoint changes. We have FME processes that we are changing from pointing to geo databases to portal. And I would like to dynamically change the rest endpoint in FME if the item changes without re-adding all the layers and connecting items. The layers never change, but the service rest endpoint might. If this is not possible, can you add it to the suggestion box? I kind of think that is possible. I mean, you're just writing to uh, ArcGIS Online equivalent of, which is portal, basically hosted portal. So, yeah, I think we'd probably have to see what you want to change there. So I think probably I would submit a case on that because we'd need to see a little bit more detail about why, what endpoints you're actually trying to change. Because I think the actual portal writer, feature service writer should be able to handle that because it's basically the data set that you want to change. Uh, we had one more question that came in. It was, I want to find all the multiply crosswalks location in an ortho photo by using machine learning. I know FME uses computer vision. Where should I start with, uh, first with pictorial reconnection? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I want to say the raster object detection transformers. Uh, those are a couple of the built-in transformers we have. With that, you have to train your own your own uh, your own model. So we have a couple of different transformers for that. There's the raster object. I'm just going to read it off here. Raster object detection model trainer, uh, raster object detection or detector sample generator, as well as a sample preparer. And then there's also the de the detector. So essentially, you're going to build your own um, your own AI that way to do it, and then you can pass in your ortho photos. Uh, the other way we connect would be using a third party service like Pictera, I believe it's called. Yeah, Pictera. So we do connect to other um, object, detector, object detectors like that as well. So we do have a, a Pictera connector um, that sends, that allows you to upload your data and process it using that service if that is a preferred option. Um, there's a, yeah, so there's a couple of different ways and we do have a blog article that kind of talks about the differences um, in the different transformers, so I can send that out. I will add that training your own model is a lot of work. 
Um, we've had somebody, one of our customers was looking at doing a similar thing with transmission lines actually and looking for cracked insulators on transmission lines from photography. And um, their experience was basically the first project that you do with that data is time consuming because you have to actually highlight in photographs what the cracked insulator looked like or in your case, the crosswalks. But um, once you have trained it, the second project will be a lot quicker because now you've trained your, your model. So the training of these machine learning things is very time consuming, um, but once you have trained it, things will speed up. That seems to be the way it works. That's a good okay. question though. So yeah, I sent a couple of articles for you there to have a look at. Uh, another question which came up is we do lots of updates to our enterprise geo database in FME using shapefile slash FGDB feature classes as the update file and a change detector to find changed features. However, when we compare geometry as well as attributes, we find all features go to the update board because of small geometry differences. Is there any way to get around this? It makes processes take um, much longer than we'd like. Maybe they need to measure the difference or skip the geometry. Yeah, I'm thinking, could this also be just a precision issue as well? Uh, not sure how many uh, decimal points either geodatabase versus shapefile store for their coordinates. So that could be another issue there. Yeah, it's usually the jiggling of the lower coordinates that happens. Um, particularly when you're if you're writing to SDE, um, because SDE is an integer coordinate system, and uh, shape and file geo database use floating points. So yeah, often rounding the coordinates up will help um, with that problem. And there's a transformer called the attribute rounder that, or sorry, the coordinate rounder. Yeah. And there is also a vector tolerance on the change detector. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, another question that came up was, "Hello, we calculate tracks length of uh, uh, tracked length of end in arc. We use intersect and dissolve and field cal to calculate. In FME, we use line on area overlay and line combiner. The problem is that FME comes up with about 17 miles short of what the arc comes up with. Any ideas?" on how to fix it and why? Uh, yeah, nothing on the top of my head. Um, I think this would be one that it would be interesting to take a look at the data and see this um, as a case. So this is kind of an area where our support specialists could look at the look at the uh, actual data set and take a, take a look at the geometry, see what's happening in the workspace and compare it to that process in, um, in Esri or in um, ArcMap. So, that would be an interesting one to to look at as a case. Mark or Dan, any other ideas for that? No, I'd have to see it. I'm, I'm just wondering if it's something to do with measuring um, the length of it. Yeah, and also the line, maybe the wrong coordinate system. So that's uh, one place. Uh, often people, uh, we actually have a coordinate system 101 webinar next week. So we would encourage anybody who's interested in coordinate systems to and not that familiar with them to join that webinar. Um, but uh, often these problems occur because you're using a coordinate system that is not appropriate for the region that you're working in. And one of the coordinate systems that people love to use is Mercator because that's what Google and other people present their data in because it's a nice, easy way to view worldwide data. But it, there is a lot of distortion in that coordinate system. So you need to use a coordinate system that is probably more local to your area, like a UTM state plane or something like that. But if that doesn't solve your problem, definitely put a question on the community, I would say. All right. Uh, another question which came up was, I've had problems using Reprojector and uh, Pro, I, uh, Pro J Reprojector specifically with WKT. Various apps are not reading the coordinate systems correctly. I've noticed in FME version 2021.0.1, 20, 
that the Pro-J libraries were still using version 7. Will this be changed in the newer releases to Pro-J 8? Also, when will all the EPSG codes be available instead of FME definitions in Reprojector? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. We will definitely move forward with Project 8. I'm not quite sure when that will happen. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're putting a lot of effort into Project um, Again, this is, this is a good question for the person to attend the coordinate system webinar next week. Um, essentially, we have many, we support many different projection engines in FME. And the first one we had in FME was from CS Map. Um, that was an open source uh, coordinate reprojection engine taken over by Autodesk and then dropped by Autodesk. And so it's a little old. So we're not going to be putting too much effort into Reprojector, which runs the CS Map engine. And more of our effort will be putting will be putting into the Proj reprojection and also the Esri reprojection, which is the Esri have now um, made available, and you don't have to be licensed to use their engine. So those are the two coordinate system reprojection engines. I think that we will be pushing forward mostly in the future. There is a handy tool on our community though if you want or the website if you want to build your own EPSG coordinate system for um, the reprojector you can do that online. I'm not quite sure where that is. Maybe Dan can find that for us. Okay. Another question that came up was I have data stored in LL WGS84. And I want to get the area in meters. What's the easiest way to accomplish this? I think uh, we do have a hub transformer that is a geographic area calculator. So this is one way to do it where you can kind of set the units that you want to uh, calculate. So you can set it to meters. Um, the other way, essentially what's happening in that uh, custom transformer from the FME hub is it's reprojecting the data into a a coordinate system that uses meters as the units. So the other way would be to reproject your data into something that uh, is a local coordinate system or something that just uses units and then perform the area calculation and then reproject back to your source coordinate system. And then okay. again, uh, with that one too, if your area is already stored in an attribute, uh, you can just use that attribute uh, coordinate system, or sorry, that attribute reprojector and that'll handle it for you. So it depends if it's stored in geometry or, or if you need to calculate the area. Okay. Another user asks, what is the best way to automatically detect changes in sheet names of an Excel or CSV reader? Um, if, uh, like for file sheet name changes monthly, but data schema stays the same for, for him uh, and not have the workspace generate an error. Does this kind of get touched on the schema drift webinar, Mark? Is that kind of included in that? It's a pretty big topic, so. Yes, I think that would, I mean, CSV readers, that's the name of the file. Um, so that's basically just the, the file that you selected. So I think that one is easier. Sheet names in Excel would be harder to detect whether they changes, but there is, when you add an Excel reader to your, um, workspace there is an option that buried down there that says something like dynamic um, read or something like that and that gives a bit more flexibility on how FME will read this Excel spreadsheet essentially going with the schema that's in the current file that you're looking at and uh, using that with some of the dynamic workflow ideas that um, we have as tutorials for I think we'll probably solve that problem. See if we can find that dynamic workflow. Right. Oh, is it the multiple file parameters, additional file settings? Yeah. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, as uh, as Mark mentioned, if you go into the Excel Reader parameters, and if you scroll down, there's a multiple file parameters section. You can expand that. Um, by default, it uses the FME default settings, but you can change it to use current settings, which might help. Okay. Another question which came up was that um, I've had issues with special characters, uh, ASCII, 
publishing to portal Esri. So, uh, Esri said it might be a bug, but to try to prevent it, I saw an FME hub transformer that looks for these, but it's out of date for Python 2.7. Any other ways to look for all of these, such as accented characters? I tried string pair replacer, but this only works if I can predict the problem characters. Uh, my answer there would just be to put a comment on that hub transformer that you found and say, can we get this updated and somebody will update it for Python 3. In the short term, you can also install uh, FME Workbench with Python 2.7. Uh, that's only, you can only set that at the time of install. So that's another option I could help you in the short term. Um, or if you're Python savvy, obviously you can update it to to three to two seven or three six if you're um, comfortable with that. Okay, another user asks, old guy here using GIS, but only used FME a couple of times long ago. I've worked in the energy space in GIS IT for last for the last ten years. I'd like to get to a basic level of understanding of for FME, FME and uh, what it can do for the company as an additional tool in all my belt personality. What is the most efficient way to get into that point in short order? That's a great one. And ba basically all our training is free at Safe Software. So the... Um, I don't know how the training is scheduled nowadays, Chris, do you know? But um, somewhere we have a training schedule. Take a FME workbench introduction would be my um, answer. That would be presented both online and on demand. Get going there, we have the equivalent for FME server. Hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of, um, as Mark mentioned, we have a couple of uh, I would say like outlets for training, so to speak. So it really depends on how much time you're able to devote to this. Um, the, the class that Mark was just mentioning is for live online. Typically that runs about two hours a day over the course of, I think it's two days, sometimes four days. Um, if you have more time and want to dedicate it in more of like a scenario specific training, we also have the FME Academy, which is more um, with those solutions built into the training. Uh, but if you only have something like 15 minutes, we also have a bunch of getting started tutorials. So on the FME community, we have uh, like getting started with FME desktop, getting started with FME server. And these can take you about half an hour uh, to an hour, anywhere in that range. Um, so there's a lot of different options. And I'll send you a few different links that can help you with this. But one other thing is we have a team dedicated to helping uh, show proof of concepts if in the case that you are new to FME and you want to see what it's capable of doing in your organization. So we're always happy to help put these proof of concepts together and help demonstrate how FME can work for your organization. So if you're ever curious about that, we, we do have a bunch of different team members that can help with that. So always feel free to either chat out to chat out to us on live chat or just email us at info at safe.com. All right, Anne asks, do you have any example FME workspaces for converting BIM slash Revit data to GIS? And the second one is, we are working on setting up a portal and have a lot of services that go up and down and are changing. This means that the rest of the point changes. We have FME processes that we are changing from pointing to geodatabases to portal. And I would like to dynamically change the rest uh, endpoint in FME. If the item changes without re-adding all the layers and connecting, uh, reconnecting items, the layer uh, never changes, but the service rest endpoint might. If this is not possible, can you add it to the suggestion box? Mm -hmm. That's a, another good question. I'm not very BIM savvy. Um, Mark, Dan, any? Well, we just did a webinar on BIM, so I posted that into the answers. Um, so that's a good starting point, and usually those webinars have links to resources on our uh, community through articles and so on. So I think that's probably the place to uh, start there, um, and then uh, if that doesn't help, maybe ask a question on the community. The other second question there, which is kind of longer, I didn't quite follow because I was thinking about the first question. 
Right. Another question that was asked was, can you use the coordinate extractor or the geometry extractor on other kinds of files like DWG or DGN? Yep, definitely. Uh, you can use all the coordinate system or all the coordinate transformers um, on any, diff any different file types. For the most part, almost every transformer works with any file we support. Of course, there's going to be some caveats to that. So we do have Excel-specific transformers, DWG-specific transformers. Uh, those are all typically prefixed with the file format that it's uh, meant to be used with. Um, so yeah, you can use those. Okay. And obviously, if you ever have any, any questions about this, we do have the help. So whenever you add a transformer to the canvas, if you open up the parameters on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see the help button. So that will tell you if it has any file-specific dependencies. As I mentioned, for the most part, they're all applicable to all formats, uh, but some do have uh, geometry-specific support. So you can find all this information in the help documentation. All right. Another question that came through is, is there a way to have attribute fields that are live URL links in an Esri file geodatabase or Esri shapefile? They want it to be a clickable URL link in fields that show up uh, in the description pop-up box in Google Earth uh, KML slash KMZ file. I'm pretty sure the answer is yes here. Yeah, this question has come up recently. I don't remember the exact answer though. I'm sure it's possible. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that for the KML pop-up box, that's just HTML. So you would just have to uh, tag it in an ahref uh, HTML tag. Um, I have a KML transformations tutorial here, and there's one article that shows KML balloon contents and removing directions. Uh, another one for um, how to handle stuff in HTML. So I will send out uh, yeah, here we go. Highlight KML icons and labels and stuff like that. So I'll send out that full full tutorial uh, as it might help with a few of those different articles in there. Okay. Another question that came up is, does Safe Software have any inexpensive license level of FME for personal slash educational uses like Esri does for Pro? Within like a uh, hundred dollars a year. Even better, we have the free license for home use. Uh, so any personal non-commercial use can be, uh, you can get a free home use license, which is good for 365 days. Um, at that point, you can just renew it. Um, and it's kind of ongoing. There's a couple of different free licenses we have available with that. So the home use is one. Um, obviously we have the, the free trial evaluation license, which is good for 60 days. Um, there's also education licenses as well. All right. Um... Because we have uh, a few minutes left uh, for this webinar, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We have a ton of great questions that came through. Uh, if we weren't able to get to any of the questions that you may have left in, feel free to uh, put these questions in and hang around um, or send it into our uh, support staff later on, and we will get to these questions and answer them after the webinar ends. Uh, we'll uh, we'll have a bunch more questions that we'll answer right now, and then uh, we will be off. So another question that came through is: Is there a connector for data transfer to and uh, from BMO Maximo, uh, IBM Maximo, sorry, and IBM Tririga, uh, or Microsoft 365 products? Uh, Mark, do you know about the Maximo side? I think Dave's been working on that. Yeah, we are working on that. I don't know whether that was a published yet so you can ask for those um so we have been working with both maximo and trireader actually and so um there will be connectors for those coming up um microsoft 365 i'm not sure about but yeah i think um, on the 365 side that would be like the the OneDrive connector would be one. Uh, SharePoint might also be another one. We do have transformers for that. Um, I know there's a Teams connector on the FME Hub that was recently released. Um, Dan, any others come to mind for you on the no, just, those ones, um, OneDrive and the SharePoint connectors? Yeah. The other option you have here, if if there isn't, if there is something that we don't have a direct connection to, but it has an API, you can always use the HTTP caller and make those API calls yourself. 
uh, we do have a lot of different uh, articles and webinars that go over getting started with uh, working with REST APIs. It is relatively straightforward and can help you get data in and out of your systems. So if you're working with something like Microsoft Dynamics on the Microsoft side, uh, you can interact with it via the API. So back to Maxima and Tririga. Yep, there's a ton of um, transformers that we have published up there um, that you can experiment. I mean, the thing about custom transformers is you can modify them for your own use. So um, often they're they're just there as a pattern, and uh, you can take those, steal those ideas, and uh, repurpose them for the actual use that you need them for. So. Uh, I will post in the chat because it is a great um, uh, great resource, uh, the link to FME Hub, which is where um, safe staff and also a lot of our users post up their um, their work so that and share them with other people. So uh, I'll put that up in the chat there. If you just search for FME Hub on Google, it'll pop up anyway. Um, we're just a minute over time here. Um, we might just go ahead and share out that webinar badge code slide for anyone who might be interested in redeeming a badge code for watching our webinar this morning on the community. Awesome. And I think we might have a grand reveal on the next transition here of that code. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning. As Arya mentioned, I might just reiterate if you are, if you do have a couple minutes to hang around, we'll be back on the chat here answering any last questions that come in. And if we aren't able to get to your question this morning, we will be sure to follow up with an email as well. For uh, the code for today, it's SGLMB. So if you can go to webinar badge, fmel.ly forward slash webinar badge, you can claim it. And otherwise, um, guys, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Uh, you can try FME trial at save.com slash trial. And thank you for bearing with us. So there's one here that I'll try and answer. FME is converting curves to lines for Esri Enterprise Geo Database during transformer, transformation. Um, is there a way to keep curves? So actually stroking of curves into lines usually happens when you reproject the data. Now FME does have some tricks that it plays uh, and it will try and rebuild the arc to see um, if it can match the new coordinate system and if it can be relatively close then it will actually keep or rebuild the arc but keep an arc but if the distortion is too much then FME will drop the arc and stroke it so it's probably that one is probably related to reprojection of the data. There's uh, another question there um, about um, LiDAR data. I'm trying to build my neighborhood in Minecraft using some LiDAR data. Um, I'm not quite sure how to do that, but I'll, if you search for FME in Minecraft, you'll come up with some great videos of what people have done in building Minecraft. I'm not sure whether they've actually done it from LiDAR data. But um, essentially, our Minecraft writer does create LiDAR points and then convert those into the blocks. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be doable. Um, one of our partners, Sweco, um, did a ton of work uh, building Minecraft models. And one of our colleagues, Dimitri Barr, he's also done, built a ton of fun models. So if you search for FME and Minecraft, you'll come up with something, some ideas, I think, and uh, certainly doable. All right, I think uh, we are reaching about five minutes over time now. I think uh, we have answered most questions. Thank you guys for sticking around, whoever is still left. Uh, we will be ending the webinar now. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to uh, ask us in our support hub. Free, feel free to go into FME community, or if you wanna learn something new on how to work with FME, join the FME Academy today. Thank you guys. Thank you, uh, Mark, Christian, and Daniel for uh, being on today. It's, it's, it's quite a gloomy morning today, but uh, I feel like we have answered a lot of questions and we have made lives easier for a lot of our users. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Have a good one. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.
Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.